On behalf of Primary Stages and ESPA, I welcome you all, those of you who are new, those of you who are returning to today's uh, Playwriting Lunch and Learn. Uh, just for those of you who may not know who we are, Primary Stages is an off-Broadway theater company located in New York City. And ESPA, the Einhorn School of Performing Arts, is the school that's part of Primary Stages for emerging and established artists. And now we get to reach people virtually, not just in New York City, but around the country, around the world. So it's really exciting to be sharing this virtual space with you today. My name is Kelly Letourneau. I'm the ESPA Student Services Associate and Primary Stages team member. So if you have any questions about Primary Stages or ESPA or anything we talk about today, please feel free to send me an email. I am so excited for today's uh, host, uh, our, our artist on the line is actor, director, writer, clown, teacher, and a human being whom I deeply admire, Zachary Klein. Hey, Zach. Hi. 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 Uh, recently, Zach appeared in Time in of Athens at Theater for a New Audience. Some of his other credits include Measure for Measure at Tafana, Vanity Fair by Kate Hamill at The Pearl, The Two Gentlemen of Verona with Fiasco Theater Company, for which he earned a Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Play. I did. Kind of adult. What? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> China Doll on Broadway and countless other per productions at theaters like Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival, the Folger Theater, the Guthrie Theater, Playmakers Repertory Theater, a solo theater company, and more. He's also, you know, he's appeared in TV and film, Person of Interest, Black Box, Heartland, One Life to Live, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Z Rock. And Zach is also uh, a writer, and he's written plays such as The Wilderness, Walden, Manifest Destiny, which he created with Aitor Basauri of Spy Monkey, and Lucas Caleb Bruni. And uh, right now, he's working with Spy Monkey on a, a project with uh, the Orchard Project. Can I, name, can I name names? Sure. Great. It's called Dennis. It's really cool. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited to have Zach here. How you doing, Zach? I'm doing well. Thanks, Kelly. Nice Hi. to see you. So, uh, I figured today we can start um, from kind of the beginning and kind of like, you're a multi-hyphenate. Yeah. That's, that's a lot to unpack. So many hats. Uh, how did, what came first for you? The acting, the writing, the clown, the directing? Um, acting, I think, pretty much acting. Um, acting came first, although I was, uh, before I even went to study acting, I was living in Wyoming after I, I had done theater all through high school um, as, uh, and middle school and always loved theater and was a theater person. Um, and then uh, I did it a bit in college as well, but I, I didn't end up majoring in theater. I did other things. And then after college, I was wandering a lot and so I ended up in Wyoming living there and I lived there for a few years and uh, I was bartending and um, uh, not sure what I wanted to do had always loved theater and wasn't sure about things but there was a clown who was living in Wyoming uh, named Bob Berkey uh, who was a well-known clown for years he traveled the world with a group called the Alchemadians um, and uh, with a great juggler named Michael Motion. And um, Bob was running this uh, tiny little theater, this beautiful little theater in Wyoming. And I went and took his class. I, I literally saw a flyer for it. And the fall is a slow time in Wyoming. And so I was like, oh, I'll just I'll go take a theater class. And it was just the most wonderful assortment of people from different walks of life and just just there for a pleasurable sort of community theater class with this clown. And I, I had done and had not much, ex I hadn't had much exposure at all to clown at all. And I didn't know what I was getting into. And I just, I just loved it so much. And, um, and at the end of it, you know, he was like, Hey, do you, do you want to, you want to do a play? Like I have the keys to this theater uh, in Wyoming and you know, why don't we do a play? And I was like, that's a great idea. And so I stayed for a few extra years <laughs> and did some plays with him and, and, was, and, and was exposed to his, he was my first clown teacher. Um, and 
that was a really uh, that was a really lucky and great experience to have, and that really pushed me to go further in the direction of being an actor. And then I ended up going back to New York, and um, and although my life as a uh, that was like fully invested in clown didn't begin till after grad school. I met these great clown teachers along the way. Uh, one of them was a guy named Gregor Pazlovsky, who used to teach at the old Actors Center, and then uh, Christopher Bays, obviously. And 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 I kept on being like, "What is this work? I don't know what it is, but it is so appealing to me." Just this. Uh, naked vulnerability of standing up in front of people and not having a clue that feels pretty akin to my daily life so i i guess i'm just uh it seemed seemed like the the, the right world for me uh lacking ideas or talent or ingenuity and still like being maybe interesting I, all right i'll sign up for that uh so i i i always was drawn to that work but then I got this terrible notion in my head that I was a serious actor. And uh, I went to grad school uh, um, where I uh, was determined to be an actor. And, uh, and I tried my best um, and did some acting and enjoyed, enjoyed it. Uh, and I loved grad school, it was great for me. But right when I finished, I, I went back to this hunt for more clown work and more. And I, and I really began working with Christopher Bayes then, and that was, that was the time in which he really had a huge impact on my life. And then from there, I went to Paris and studied with Philippe Goyer, who's another wonderful clown teacher, and then with Spy Monkey, and then went to the Circus Center in San Francisco, and was just, for a number of years, was just, uh, it just became the space that I felt most artistically fulfilled. Um, and I didn't know, where it was leading in any way, or if it was gonna evolve into like a teaching life. Uh, I just knew that that was the space that I was expanding the most as a human being. And, uh, and, and so it began, I guess the acting began and the clowning began around the same time. And then that led to creating material. So never really thinking of myself as a writer, uh, but thinking of myself as somebody who, who just wanted to create material and 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 a lot of times over the years of being in class with chris a lot of people would say okay how do i take how do i take this work and make something with it because his classes are so uh exciting and there's so much discovery and play and uh just vibrancy and so then you're like okay how do i how do i take that and make make something from it and Chris liked to always be a little bit mysterious about that and just sort of say, well, you just do and you just figure it out and good luck. And, you know, and, and that's Chris and that's just how he rolls. And, and so I was one of those people a lot of the time who was like, how do I make something? How do I make something? And then I was like, oh, okay, just screw it. Just make something and started writing something and it, it, it evolved into a clown show. And I guess from there I was, like anybody who's written something, you know, you're just like, oh, okay, I can do it. You know, it's going to be, some parts of it are going to be terrible and some parts are going to be surprising and, and, and really fulfilling. And, and I'll try my best to tolerate myself along the way. <laughs> um, so th that, and I would say at the same time, the, uh, I started teaching out of all that clown stuff and out of the teaching came directing. Uh, uh, as, I, as I was teaching more and more, uh, people began to ask me to direct things. And that started to evolve naturally. Um, there's obviously a, cross, there's a crossover in the way that you are supporting the development of people's work and trying to partner with them. And, uh, and so the directing started to evolve out of, out of that. And that's just kind of how that, I think that's how all the pieces started to sort of evolve, I guess. That it actually is very, very clear. I have a clear story there. Um, I think we touched upon it. For the, for the folks who might not know what clown is, Yeah. what would you say are like the key principles of that work? I would say um, a relationship to an audience. Uh, so um, a performer who comes out in relationship to a lot, to, to an audience. 
Um, and, and then I would say that, you know, I like to keep the definition of clown very, very wide because I think it, it, it's something that people uh, can discover and define for themselves. And the more rigid a definition of clown, I think in some ways, the more limiting it can be. I think it's okay if it's just a relationship to an audience, an actor or person in play uh, with an audience. Um, there are lots of addendums to that, I think. Um, but fundamentally, it's just somebody who is in play with an audience. And um, what defines a clown is pretty, is pretty, I think, a pretty wide, it's a pretty wide definition. Um, some people would say it's somebody who comes out to try to make people laugh. And I, I don't think that's necessarily the, the case solely. I think it's somebody who perhaps comes out to just try to entertain the audience in some way, you know, and perhaps they come out with a, you know, often a clown at its core will probably represent something that we aspire to as human beings uh, and, uh, or embody, either embodying our bafflement, embodying our disaster, embodying our curiosity, embodying our vulnerability and our sensitivity. And uh, the clown is willing to be up there fully human in, th those, in that embodiment, in that desire for us, the audience. And in that is, there's a play, there's a, there's a, there's a playfulness, hopefully. Um, so, I don't know, sometimes that definition comes out clearly and sometimes I feel like it's really good to keep it as, as, as loose as possible because it's the type of thing that is felt and seen when, <laughs> when it happens as opposed to an academic delineation of what a clown is. Um, totally, and clown, uh, from my personal opinion for everyone on the line, clown class is really hard, <laughs> but really amazing and beautiful. Um, what does studying clown look like? It's a lot of repetition of essentially just coming out into to an audience. Uh, I think there are certain muscles at its core which are have to do with a uh, uh, an, a physical expansiveness, so a playfulness, uh, a willingness to to um, to 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 follow impulse in the body, to uh, to recognize and enjoy what a game is. Uh, and what playfulness is with another performer or and the and or the audience, um, and I think much of it is, you know, also includes imp improvisation skills as well. And um, what happens to you in front of an audience is one of the fundamental things. So I think a lot of the clown work is is repetition in the classroom of just finding different ways to come on to the stage and, and play and engage with an audience and learning how to listen to the response from the audience. It's never, it's often rarely what you want it to be, but the more we accept what it is, the more space opens up for us to play within, within, within the clown dynamic. So it's, it's, it, it is, it can be brutalizing because it will at times shatter, shatter uh, <laughs> one's sense of whether you think you're, you're funny or your ideas are good or the audience, you, the audience is going to tell you a lot and how you play and respond to that audience uh, is, <laughs> is, is going to, uh, is probably going to determine what type of performer you are. Um, but if you're unwilling to listen to how it's actually going, then it's just going to be harder and harder for you. So the more one is willing to listen to what's actually happening in the room, I think the more we can step into the magical act of being together. Uh, and I think the clown has the potential to to really bring a group together 
uh, because they're in direct relationship with that audience. So there's something holy to it, for sure. Uh, and and, and it, it's no surprise that it has a spiritual lineage to it uh, because it's deeply connected to, uh, to figures in communities that have served as shaman figures. So figures that have served to, 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 to gather communities or to, to be a, a, a spiritual resource in some way. And uh, uh, sometimes you have a, a, a priest or shaman type figure holding that as a, as a sort, of, uh, sort of the serious side of the world. And you sometimes need that trickster comedic element to balance out the world as well. And so there's, the clown goes deep in, in, in our, our cultural memory, in our, in our, in, in, deep in, in us, in terms of who we are as human beings. Uh, we recognize the clown as, as in us somewhere. We all have a clown inside of us. My mind is completely blown that there are like shaman connections to the clown because I've always found it holy and really the communal experience. Um, so thank, thank you for that nugget of wisdom information. Yeah. There's a great book, it's a couple of books actually, um, but one of them, there's a, a great book by this guy, Lewis Hyde, called Trickster Makes the World, which is a lovely book about tricksters. And it's very academic-y, but I love him. He also wrote this book, The Gift, which is all about art in, in uh, art and commerce. And it, it's a beautiful book. But this book is actually, I pulled out some books today, just has references in case people are interested, called The History of Clowns for Beginners which is a really fun, it's, it's, it's sort of part of a series of the history of something for beginners. So it's actually uh -huh. not like it, it, the beginner's part doesn't really mean anything, but it's a really fun book about sort of like, it's got like really fun, it's like kind of like Robert Crumb style, like drawings and, but it's really smart and fun. And uh, anyway, I just, uh, that book talks about the history of clowns a little bit in case anybody's interested. I'm interested, I'm getting that book. and. So uh, going from the world of the clown and improvisation that you might get in a classroom or, you know, working with uh, other artists, how do you navigate going to the page and back again from those like improvisational clown games and then into your writing? Individually or in a collective situation? Let's talk about individually and then perhaps in the collective. Well, there's no, probably no, as, as everyone here probably knows, there's no avoiding the misery of being a writer. <laughs> I mean, there's no, you, like, you can't go around it, you can't go over it, you just gotta go through it. And, <laughs> So at the end of the day, like there ain't no trick to, to writing other than just keep your ass on the chair or wherever it is and keep going. Uh, even though you're like, my idea sucks. It's terrible. I hate everything I'm doing. I hate my writing. I hate my chair. I hate my coffee, everything. I mean, that's just, that's just the part of it that we all recognize. And the toleration that we like give ourselves is the space we have to grow as artists. So, you know, when we, when we develop that muscle of tolerance, uh, I think we uh, give ourselves that space to just, to just fail and to be messy with our work. And, and uh, we all know that, but every one of us needs constant reminders of it because I, I just feel profoundly like it, it just keeps coming back. To, to try to attack us with our with our with our with our unworthiness sometimes, or I'll just speak for myself. I feel that often, and yeah, but with the clown, you can speak for me too because I feel that as well. <laughs> I feel like with the clown work, what it does is it, clown work is is uh, often good for resiliency, uh, in the sense of like um, a surrendering to what is in the it, you know in the world of the clown, what, what's actually happening is, is, a, is a good place to begin uh, because then you get a lot of information about what's actually going on as opposed to how you want things to be or how you wish they were. Um, and so 
I think the, my best moments uh, as a writer in relationship to the way clown has affected my life is when uh, I remember in my body the freedom I felt as a performer in clown class. Uh, and somehow I, I give myself permission to have that type of freedom of not being smart or not being right or not being excellent or perfect, but just, just, just letting it go as best I can and I can assess it later. That, that permission from clown class that has released huge reservoirs of creativity and inspiration in me physically in, 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 on my feet, I think can translate to be, being on the page. Because a lot of times I, I'll say to people like, you know, you can't solve this problem of, 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 of coming out to an audience. Like you can't solve it before at all. You just have to, you, you come out with your best idea and you, you, you give it your best shot and you live in relationship. It's an active relationship. It might flop and it might succeed. Both are really possible. But um, I think giving myself the permission to do that has helped a lot. So, and in, and in terms of, uh, you know, I guess the, style of work that has emerged. Um, I think I've been really informed by knowing, like, I think I'm just terrified of things getting boring. So, you know, like a clown wants to stay on stage for a while or as long as they can, you know? I mean, a good clown knows when to come on and knows when to leave but hopefully you stay on for as long as you can. Uh, but sometimes you, you know, I, anyway, I, I think that a direct relationship to the audience as well has informed my writing a lot. You know, that, that, that not only clown, but also a lot of work in Shakespeare has made my life as, as, as a writer very much uh, <laughs> In, in uh, uh, there's a very porous relationship between me and the audience and rarely is there a fourth wall. I don't know how to create a piece with that right now. That's all I have to say about that. I, can you hear the lawnmower outside my window? No. Oh, amazing. I've been fretting about it. But... Wait, let me look. Oh, I can see it, but. You can see it? Yeah, yeah, I can oh, see God. it. The guy should really put a shirt on. Um, so our friend Andrew sent in a really great question. Uh, I know you've uh, written a play about Henry David Thoreau. But yes. And Andrew, yeah. Andrew is asking, when writing a historically based play, how do you balance the research component with your poetic license as a playwright? Well, I've only written two historical plays and they've both been about the same guy. Uh, they've both been about Henry David Thoreau. And, um, and I am obsessed with research. So, um, so the balance of it is there's always funny sh stuff in people's actual history uh, uh so you just keep digging and if you want to make comedy out of it and it's i don't know about the balance of it i just think um it just depends on style and to a tone of the piece you know it just depends on what type of piece you want to make, uh, uh, you know, Hamilton is successful because in many ways, I think it just has that tension of it's, it's an incredible artistic creation, but we somehow trust that the majority of it is rooted in truth. Uh, and uh, if we feel like the author is manipulating that truth for some other uh, agenda, 
uh, I think that that's a that's that's delicate. You can break something in that contract if you're dealing with real people. Um, you have, in some ways, I feel an obligation to preserve something of truth with a real person. And, and that truth might be a poetic truth that is excised from, from, the, from the historical circumstances. And then we will recognize as audience that, that, that there is a, a deliberate manipulation of some truth for another reason. Um, but that I do believe that you, I mean, I do believe you are engaging in some ways with spirits. I do believe that like uh, you have to respect that to a certain extent when it's somebody who actually lived a life. Uh, and uh, however you choose to is the style with which you will create your work. So I think there's tons of artistic uh, ways to, to create something from a historical situation. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a dry biographical piece. Um, but there are fantastic, there are crazy things that happen in um, the, the, my play Bewilderness, but they're all true. You know, there was, there's a, a psychos, there's a theme of sort of mirroring and self and uh, the, 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 uh, the brothers these two brothers, just take a little diversion, they, Henry David Thoreau got psychosomatic lockjaw, which is a whole true thing. But the poetic possibilities of that as a creator were so huge and useful. But I just did tons of research on, on, on what that was. And um, anyway, so ultimately, I think adhering to uh, doing as much research as possible can be really useful. And for you, freeing, it sounds like relish the research a, a tricky balance i mean I, I i have a stack of like 75 books on thoreau i don't think that's necessarily healthy um but uh so it does become a bit of an obsession and i do feel like i am still learning how to balance my desire to consume information and when to let that go and uh feel like i can I, I can just trust something creatively. So I, I think it can become a crutch at a certain point. And, I, and I've found both to be the case. So cutting yourself off, uh, off from it and then creating you know, binders or, or spaces where you keep notes. Sometimes I would just devote periods of time to taking notes on certain books and keep those in a document so that I just had those notes. Uh, and so that I could just go to that document and take out a piece and then explore that piece of that note. Um, so ultimately the intensity of that research has been really useful, but it's, 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 been, it's, it's been crippling at, at times. I can I feel like, yeah. Sometimes I feel like research for me will keep, keep my ass out of the writing chair. Keep it in the reading chair. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, sure. totally. yeah. uh, Amy just sent me a question. Uh, hi, Amy. She is asking, what do you find the most useful when, get, when getting feedback for something in development? How do you navigate the balance between accountability and pushing through, but also like being nice to yourself and giving your mind a break? What do I find, what do I find most useful? Uh, when getting feedback. Feedback? Yeah. A lot of times I find myself asking like, what part were you confused at? Where were you confused? What are there parts that were confusing for you? Did you have a sense of what was going on? Um, plays want to live as, uh, as, as, as sort of in action. So it's like just, you wanna feel the rhythm of a play one way or another that goes from action to action to action, whether they're internal or external. Uh, and each play will have a different rhythm that pulls us along. Comedy has a different rhythm than a drama and so forth, but uh, the rhythm is made up of the pieces of action, the events that pull us along. So I think when people are, con I ask a lot, like, well, what was confusing? You know, uh, it's not, it's not, the, you know, the, the, the like and not like is, 
is not is not necessarily helpful and funny or not funny it's like you got to find that on your own and some people are going to think things are funny and other people are not and with a play you never actually know if something's funny at all until it's in front of people uh and it all depends on i mean you can have a sense that a lot of people can read it and be like that's funny that's a funny monologue that's a funny scene but Ultimately, you got to continue to define your own sense of funny, which is really scary and vulnerable. But uh, I think you got to be really careful how many people you show your work to. I just think it gets confusing when a lot of people are giving a lot of different opinions and a lot of different feedback. Uh, and I think that one or two people once in a while along the way can give a little bit of feedback. But I find that too many different voices just really muddies the water completely. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, Amy. Um, I don't know if that gets at, uh, gets at it. Um, and I'm trying to think I mean, the best feedback for me is hearing something out loud. Honestly, hearing it out loud because I'm often trying to write things that are eventually funny. It's rhythm. If the rhythm of it comes off the page for the actor, even on a cold read, then I think, okay, the rhythm is there comedically. So much of comedy is about the music of it. Circumstances and music. Once you find the heart of the circumstances, then find the sort of the, the music of that section. And if an actor can pull it off the page really quickly, it's a good sign. Um, so I need to hear it. I need to hear it out loud. A lot of times I think, think, think something's funny and I hear it out loud and it's just me going on and on and on. Well, thank you. I think that. Amy, you're good. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm just going back to my list. Did you have any other books you wanted to share with us that you pulled? I pulled all these books out. Oh, then please I, share. I pulled, I pulled a bunch out, but just as like reference points, if useful. Um, and I, I, I have so many, but I guess I was gonna say like, one of the things, I have a bunch of clown books and if anybody wants lots of clown book recommendations, I'm happy to give them. But I think one of the, one of, uh, one of the things I, I brought out were like myth books because uh, myths help me a lot when I just read myths because they're like, you know, they're like uh, templates for things. And so they inspire when I feel uh, lost a little bit because uh, the, there's like, these underlying stories that exist in uh, in us as 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 a culture, and they've been coming up for thousands of years. And so, going back to some of those baseline myths, whatever culture they're from, I found those really useful when I'm a little bit stuck. It'll sort of it'll place the story in in inside of the frame of certain myths, or or almost place it in the frame of that. And those myths are helpful to sort of dialectically in my mind, play the myth off with the story I'm trying to create. Um, and then just like, this is a book called Serious Play, which is, uh, there are a number of books like this out there, which is like about clown theater type yeah. stuff, which is um, sort of journalistic, a sort of, you know, but nice to know like what other types of Sort of clown theater people are making out there. Um, and then uh, this is like a classic book on clowns by John Towson, which is like sort of the Bible of, of clown stuff. Um, and then there's this like old book called Clown Scenes, which is like just these old clown scenes from like different circuses and whatnot that have been compiled. And they, they don't seem very funny on the page, but it's fun to think about them as like setups and scenarios and, and they might prompt some, uh, some, some of your own sort of exploration in comic scene making. Um, 
yeah, that's that's that that's it. I mean, there's I have tons of books, but so does everybody else. Amazing, amazing. One last question, and then we'll launch into our prompts. How about that? Sure. Cool, cool. Um, I mean, we're all we're all in this uh, situation right now, and my question for you is, what's helping? The thing that's most helpful for me is reading. I gotta be honest. I mean, for me, like, it's great to be here for, for you know, periods of the day uh, on the screen. But for me, the act of reading has been uh, an antidote to a type of isolation that I feel. Um, and I also have found that it's made me feel creative. The act of putting words together in my mind and creating story off of the story that's being offered me. The way that literature works on us. Um, the way that literature makes me feel, ref makes us be reflective. Uh, not to be too pretentious about it or too precious about it, but it has, uh, I've always been a reader, but, but I've never kind of needed it each day the way I've needed it lately. Uh, the way that the way that it soothed me, um, uh, that you know, I, I I find has been has been huge. It's been huge. So I've had to balance my uh, I've had to s relax on the need to produce material at times, or balance it out with an intake of of beauty whether that be literature or nature. Those two things for me, you know, whether I get outside for a period of time or I, uh, or I read for a chunk of time, if I don't get that in the day, then I start to feel a bit hollowed out, uh, a bit emptier. So, a lot, and a lot of times I squirm around it too. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, you know, like, but I know it's good for me, so I'll, I'll set timers for myself. You know, I'll set a timer for 30 to 45 minutes because I say, I know I need to read for 45 minutes right now. Uh, even if uh, I don't want to, I want to just like keep looking for whatever burst of like affirmation I can get from the internet. Uh, but when I cease that and I, and, I, and I come out of a reactive mode and into a reflective mode, uh, I find that that actually is a much more human place to be and our society is engineered to make us reactive rather than reflective right now. And, and I think that that is uh, how, we be, how we become more whole, how we, how we find a little bit more integration of self is through any way in which one can be reflective. So for me, it's been literature, other people it might be meditation, other people it might be exercise, other people it might be nature, but to be reflective. Is, is so fundamentally important right now, even though it hurts, but it's, it's about allowing things to move. I have no one to say. <laughs> um, shall we dive into the prompt? The prompt, yes. Yes, so I will have Zach introduce the first part and then I'll put on a timer Kelly, also, I forgot one thing. I know you wanted yeah. me to mention what, about the note cards and showing that. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, but I'm happy to, to walk us over there for a second because Kelly asked me to show one part. Welcome to my home. Um, but to show one part of the process that I go through in creation, and, and it's this, which is when I'm working on a piece. Can you all see that? Can you see that? Yeah. When I'm working on a piece, I'll... Uh, I'll often make note cards like that to section out uh, ideas that have come up in the process um, that are uh, either scenes that I wanna write, little scenes that I have written, characters that I might wanna write, just all, all everything, just a, like a, a grab bag of it all, just as a way to, put it up there in front of me. Everybody has sort of, I think, different processes with that. You know, some people make storyboards or different note cards or whatever, but that's, that's how I, I 
That's how I, I do have it. a piece of butcher paper attached to a cabinet right now that I'm writing on. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so that's all different projects, ideas? No, that's just one. And I have like sets, stacks of note cards for different projects that when I'm working on them, I'll, I'll start to put them up. Um, yeah, I have a, a, another show I'm, I'm writing with the performer Bryce Pinkham. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're creating this show. And so I have like a whole stack of our note cards from that divide, from that process we've gone through. And then I'll put those note cards up, even if they're just like, I think we should do this, or I think we should do that. So I think I saw a video of that piece. Where he, like, oh, you might have seen a, a video of, of, of a, a section of something we've done yeah. for a benefit. And yeah, 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 yeah. I, it's, I think it's on um, Facebook or something. Yes, he dresses up his knee and it looks like a person. Yeah, he uses a clown nose on his knee. Yeah. 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 And then well, he sings like the Tony nominee that he is. It's he's great. got a beautiful voice. Yeah. I'm ready to He's tag. A beautiful man. He's a beautiful man. He's, he is a beautiful man. I wasn't going to, you said it. <laughs> he is a beautiful man. Shall we write? Can we talk about that? <laughs> Let's do some writing. Okay, writing. I'm going to write about Bryce Pinkham. Um, cool. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my prompt. And remind me how we were going to break this down, Kelly. So, yeah. you'll introduce the first portion of the list, and I will time for three minutes, and then okay. we'll go into a monologue for one of those items, five minutes of writing, I'll time it, and then we'll uh, do the next one, like five minute chunk, and then you'll say goodbye. Cool. And then I'll break out people into breakout rooms. They can chat about the process, what they're looking forward to, um, what they might put on note cards on their walls, and we'll go on with our day. Cool. So my prompt is, it sort of comes from a little bit of a clown perspective, which is uh, imagining uh, a person or uh, a thing, uh, or a person, place, or thing, I guess, backstage waiting to come on waiting to come on stage to uh, talk to the audience or to do something with the audience, to speak to the audience. And uh, so I like to imagine like, you know, who's waiting back there, ready to come out and just start talking. And I, I find in the writing process that even with characters that don't end up having monologues in the, sh the things that I've made, writing monologues is a thing that I like to do with them because they start to give me information about who they are or what's going on in the story or it ends up maybe being useful someplace else or um, so I rarely use a lot of them but they end up somehow in the shows in different ways so uh, the prompt is three to five uh, so Kelly you want to take over from there actually so we'll start with um, making a list. Three to five things, people, objects, anything. And give them a name, give them a name. And give them a name. So a list, three to five things, objects, people with names waiting to go on stage to talk to an audience. Yeah. It's great, I'm gonna put three minutes on the clock and start writing, make that list. Okay.
Hey, that's three minutes. What do we do now? We do, we, uh, we explain the next part, but I'm scrolling to find it. Ah, there it is. Um, now we're gonna explain writing the monologue for one of those things. And then we're gonna spend like five minutes writing that. Oh, was that just coming up with the names? I was just coming up with the names. Did you already start writing monologues? I did. You're an overachiever. Yeah, I'll write another. Do you want to explain the, the process of writing a, a monologue for one of these objects now, now that we have our list? Sure, I mean, it, it's really simple in the sense of uh, it just coming out to the audience and letting one sentence lead to the next. I, I mean, uh, I just feel like a direct address is a really great way to just get the pen moving. Uh, the, it's not about an idea, it's just active. Hi, hello, whatever you say first, doesn't matter, but you just get the, so, like, your unconscious is gonna lead you. It's just, I mean, we know that. But the active relationship with an audience in your mind, in your imagination, uh, for the character, I think, can really draw out something that if we get permission to it, will take us, will take us somewhere. So letting, letting that character just take you once they start to try to talk to the audience. And this character really wants to talk to the audience. I don't know. Okay. I don't know, but they're out there. Okay, great. But so not want to talk to the audience. <laughs> I'll put five minutes on the clock and everybody just free write. And I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. So five minutes and. I'm just grabbing a notebook. Okay. Another one. Okay. You finished a notebook too? I was at the end of another one, so. Okay. All right, five minutes, go.
All right, now we're gonna stop writing for that character. Go back to your list, look at your list, pick one more item. Imagine that they have just stepped out onto the stage and are addressing the audience. Your five minutes starts right about now.
that's time. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. I, I, I loved it. It's so nice to be, to feel a sense of being with people, even if we're not actually together. And to the faces on the screen that I recognize, uh, I send you my love and say hello. And I hope you're all doing as well as possible. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, and happy, happy writing, happy creation, you know, Let's, let's continue to push, push the world towards light and love with all that we try to do. So thank you for being in that community of light and love. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today has been especially wonderful and I hope the rest of your week is filled with light and love and that we can all carry this with us. Uh, the takeaway prompt is really just to continue on that list, continue writing, taking five minutes, just you know, let whatever comes out of a monologue for each one of those items on your list and then go back, follow your pleasure, follow what interests you right from the object that um, really brings you the most joy, the most pleasure, sparks your curiosity. Um, and thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next week. Bye everyone. <laughs>